For this presentation, I'm going to present a uh, case of management of hypoplastic left heart syndrome and carry on the theme that we've already uh, started during the early part of the sessions and go over how this is a team approach. So as we showed earlier, this is a fetus who came uh, for an echocardiogram and was found to have hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Uh, as we previously said, there's a large right ventricle right here, a large right atrium, just this little sliver of left ventricle and a smaller uh, left atrium. So hypoplastic left heart syndrome consists of severe aortic stenosis or aortic atresia uh, and or severe mitral stenosis or atresia and um, no matter which results in a very small non-functional left ventricle with no way to get blood to the systemic circulation uh, except the ductus arteriosus. So that's what this cartoon shows, a very small almost non-existent left ventricle um, with still the presence of this ductus arteriosus, the fetal structure that connects the pulmonary artery to the descending aorta. You could see that as in most cases, the ascending aorta right here and the transverse aortic arch is also quite hypoplastic. So after birth, infants become acutely ill uh, when the ductus arteriosus closes. So this can be generally within the first day, uh, sometimes at two or occasionally three days of life. Um, poor systemic cardiac output is caused by the anatomic obstruction of blood flow to the body. So the real question is, how do we get from the diagnosis to a healthy baby that goes home? So the majority of prenatal uh, diagnoses, as we've sort of hinted at, are made after the quote unquote anatomy ultrasound or the ultrasound performed uh, generally around 18 to 20 weeks for surveillance of fetal anatomy. But sometimes it's later depending on um, multiple factors that might influence the, uh, the maternal imaging or uh, just sort of detective detection. As we discussed, I think prompt referral for a fetal echocardiogram is generally the next step. At the fetal echocardiogram, we'll both confirm the diagnosis as well as figure out the anatomic details, but almost more importantly, we'll also begin the process of family counseling and education. So in our program, we'll generally do a repeat fetal echocardiogram around 26 weeks, which is probably about a month later, and then again at around 32 to 34 weeks, and that, uh, that at that time we'll also um, start the pre or the delivery planning, like Dr. Chapa hinted at before. We generally will have a genetics consult if one has not been done before. Obviously, the pregnancy needs continued maternal fetal medicine follow-up to assess fetal growth, any extra cardiac anomalies, and assessments of fetal well-being. And then we'll recommend and uh, help plan delivery at the surgical center. So in terms of prenatal goals, the prenatal goals are really the comprehensive counseling um, to detail the success of both the surgical strategy, but also the short and long-term outcomes. Uh, we'll provide prenatal options, including termination, if that's appropriate. Uh, prenatal follow-up for the growth and the size of the left heart structures um, and the aorta, as well as the patency of the atrial septum, as we discussed earlier, that can be a critical issue at the time of birth. We'll develop a comprehensive delivery plan and we'll help counsel the family for the, uh, the issues that may occur in infancy, as well as long-term care. So, at the 32-week visit, we consider this often our sort of comprehensive counseling visit. It's not always at 32 weeks, sometimes before, but the, um, the mother will generally get a fetal echocardiogram and continued cardiology counseling. We'll have a maternal fetal medicine consult and an ultrasound if it's needed at that time. A visit with the pediatric cardiac ICU physician to go over pre and post-op course and management with the neonatologist to discuss delivery room course with palliative medicine to uh, figure out family support with a congenital cardiac surgeon to go over the details of the surgery and the expected um, management, tours of the facility, as well as a delivery plan that'll include any special issues or concerns. 
delivery should be, as we discussed, ideally at the um, center where the definitive care of the infant can be provided. That's not possible in some systems where there are freestanding children's hospitals and a sort of university or other type of um, of situation that has to deliver the mother that's close by. But there certainly are advantages to uh, this all being in one site. And as we discussed, we have in our uh, system, our special delivery unit, which it sounds like we'll discuss more later, but in brief, is a small and specialized labor and delivery uh, unit that is designed for high-risk mothers who need the entire um, facilities of the um, tertiary care hospital behind them or for infants who have some type of uh, defect that need the full support of the children's hospital behind them. Um, prompt evaluation by neonatology and cardiology occurs after delivery, and bonding time is given with the parents if the infant is stable. The, the infant is then transferred to the pediatric cardiac ICU. So these babies get initially stabilized um, medically with prostaglandin, which keeps the ductus arteriosus open. Uh, our goal is actually to promote the fetal circulation, the same thing that was happening in the womb where they were fine, and that is pulmonary, the blood flows through the ductus arteriosus from the pulmonary artery to the aorta. This allows for and increases systemic output or output to the body and ideally reduces pulmonary blood flow. We minimize supplemental oxygen, occasionally use hypercarbia or hypercapnia, and uh, try to promote some mild respiratory acidosis. We promptly treat any metabolic acidosis. With regard to the surgery, I think we'll have more talks later, but we cannot restore a quote-unquote normal circulation for these babies. But the first stage is what we call a Norwood repair, which turns the right ventricle into the systemic or left ventricle and turns the pulmonary valve into the aortic valve. A shunt or a small tube then provides blood flow to the lungs. The Glenn and the Fontan are the procedures that the child has to go through later, generally at about six months and three to four years, respectively. The alternative management is a heart transplant that's usually not used primarily, but for cases where the conventional surgery, uh, for whatever reasons, is not successful. Uh, so this cartoon just shows uh, the Norwood operation. This is the case of the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. The pulmonary artery is transected and the uh, aortic arch opened up. This main pulmonary artery is going to be anastomosed to the aortic arch and the arch um, rebuilt to be of normal size which you could see right here. Here's the reconstructed aortic arch. And then this shunt puts, uh, delivers some blood flow from the right ventricle to the pulmonary arteries. These are the second and third stages, which we talked about, which I'm not gonna go through in detail right now. So with regard to post-operative care and discharge, uh, these babies have multiple medical needs. To begin with, they still have a single ventricle heart. So as we said, they're not fully corrected. This is different than some forms of congenital heart disease that we treat, even some forms of neonatal congenital heart disease that we treat. There are increased metabolic demands of the heart, and there's quite frequently extra cardiac anomalies or genetic syndromes, which also imp impact the well-being of the child. Very frequently, they have feeding intolerance and abnormalities in that area. Uh, developmental issues are much higher than the baseline population. There's often need for additional medical procedures and medications, and uh, not to be overlooked is parent and caregiver stress and depression. So we've created this journey board for the families to use when they are transferred to the step-down unit. Uh, this kind of goes over and highlights for the families as well as for the nursing staff, all of the different um, steps that the baby needs to go through prior to discharge from the hospital. Many people like a graphic representation and it helps them sort of understand what it takes for the baby to get out of the hospital. We also have a home monitoring program for these and other um, high-risk babies. The babies are discharged home with a baby scale, a pulse ox, a red flag 
action plan to let the caregivers know what might be an uh, urgent situation or an emergency, as well as a laminated card that has their diagnosis, as well as some of their expected oxygen saturation, emergency medications, things like that, that they can hang from their car seat and have with them if they need to go to an emergency room that's not part of our system or um, find themselves someplace else where they need emergency care. We have the parent or uh, guardian enroll in my chart for the baby uh, on, on the baby's behalf. And then we have an application through my chart where the parent can enter the baby's daily weight, the daily pulse ox as well as the feeding volume. This data uh, goes directly to a flow sheet in EPIC, the electronic health record, and is monitored daily by one of our nurse coordinators. We then have comprehensive outpatient visits for these uh, babies with a cardiologist, a nurse coordinator, and a dietitian. So um, unfortunately, this is not always the situation that we have for these uh, babies with such high risk uh, heart problems, but our goal is still to be able to go from here to a healthy baby at home. Thanks.